The reading from the New Testament this morning is from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. I, I always like these letters because they start with a salutation. With emails, we don't hear a salutation anymore. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, including all the saints throughout Arcadia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to console those who are in affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. If we are being afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. If we are being consoled, it is for your consolation, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we are also suffering. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our consolation. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would re lie not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He who rescued us from so deadly a peril will continue to rescue us. On him we have set our hope that he will rescue us again. As you also join in helping us with your prayers so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Here ends this morning's reading. Inviting me. Okay. Today, we begin a new sermon series based on 2 Corinthians. Now, I know you're disappointed that we're done with Job. But, you know, you can read it any time, and I would love to discuss it. But we're going to move on, and I think as you hear, as this... 2 Corinthians unfolds, you'll see why this was chosen to follow up Job, because there's actually some parallels that we're going to encounter. So why do we want to study this letter in the first place? It's one of several, which was written by Paul to the church at Corinth. It's probably one of the most difficult letters that Paul wrote for us to decipher, and its tone wavers from deep expressions of love to angry rebukes. To our modern day reasoning, if you read the letter from beginning to end, it doesn't seem to proceed in a logical fashion. Sometimes it feels like Paul's jumping around. But this letter expresses profound ideas that have had tremendous influence not only on the history of theology, but on much of Western thought. This letter has a lot to say about apostolic ministry, about how the gospel gets communicated, and what constitutes authentic Christian community. In addition to those general themes, Paul is also addressing some very practical tasks, such as defending his ministry while seeking reconciliation, raising funds for the poor, countering competitors who are challenging his ministry and in his view, leading the Corinthians astray. In responding to these challenges, Paul seeks to explain, not just in theory, but in actual practice, how God's mercy actually helps us to not only bear our own suffering, 
but that God's mercy will overflow and seep into our relationships with others and expand into communities that embody and proclaim God's reconciliation to the entire world. Now today we're looking at the very beginning of the chapter um, of the letter, which is chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and we see that it is immediately different than any of Paul's other letters. Because instead of beginning with a word of thanksgiving, as he usually does, Paul begins with a blessing that calls on God, the Father of all mercies, the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to console others in any affliction with that same consolation. So there's a whole lot in that sentence. Let's back up and look at it together. Paul's audience would have recognized this language because it draws on a central theme from the Old Testament, that God saves and liberates us from whatever is oppressing us so that we can be of service to others. Hebrew Bible scholar John Levinson summarizes this theme as the chosen are called to serve. And that's a powerful statement. The chosen are called to serve. Another thing that's powerful in this language is that throughout the literature of Israel and of the early church, the blessed be formula is used only for God. At the heart of one's blessing of God is a thankful appreciation of God's faithfulness, of God's steadfastness in making good, on all that God has promised. Paul's blessing of God opens a passage that begins with God's consolation in the face of afflictions and distress and concludes with a note of hope and thanksgiving. Now we've heard this word consolation repeated over and over. So I want to just look at that for a minute. Ms. Sherry talked about consolation um, like comfort. And it does mean that. Another interpretation for the Greek word used, that's interpreted here as consolation, is encouragement. And this interpretation, encouragement, is more in line with how Paul is using it in this letter and in this context. God's not just consoling us in our suffering, but God is encouraging us. God is coming to our aid. This theme of God's consolation and encouragement is repeated 10 times in verses 3 through 10, and 14 times in the remainder of Paul's letter. That's how important it is for Paul that the Corinthians understand the concept and accept God's encouragement. Paul is suggesting that God's consolation or God's encouragement meets human suffering and distress in an abounding fashion so that God's comfort overflows people's suffering and distress. Now this idea of blessing God may sound strange to us. We're more likely to think of or hope for God blessing us. But here Paul has it going the other way. For Paul, blessing God is another way of giving thanks. But blessing God is especially to be employed when we fall on hard times. It's a way of remembering, of reminding ourselves, reminding others that God has delivered us in the past because that's God's nature, to deliver. The God of the Exodus is our God. When we bless God, it's our acknowledgement of God's faithfulness. It helps us to remember God's deliverance in the past, and it builds our trust and expectation that God's comfort, comfort will find us in our present distress. Our God delivers and comforts. And the very act of seeking that deliverance or seeking that comfort is the first faithful response. And sometimes that's all we need. When we touch base with God, when we bless God and expect God's comfort and encouragement, sometimes 
That's all we need to open our eyes to a path that God has already made for us. Now, one thing that's important when we understand God's comfort is that that's not exactly what we think of when we think of comfort. For us, uh, comfort is a feeling, right? I have a comfortable chair. I don't ever wear comfortable shoes, right? But the problem is, if we keep that definition in our heads, then the God of comfort is just a God that would make us feel good. Paul wants us to understand it differently. Comfort is a gift that God gives or a door that God opens as a way out of our suffering. Another problem that we encounter when we read Paul's words through our own lens, in our own context, is that in today's culture, sometimes we have the idea that if we're right with God and God blesses us, that means we're successful, we're rich, we're, we have prosperity. And when we have adversity or affliction or suffering, that that's a sign of God's displeasure or God's judgment. But I want to be very clear. Jesus did not think that suffering or physical problems were a result of sin. And neither does Paul. Nowhere in this letter or anywhere in anything that Paul writes does Paul say that suffering or distress is a result of sin. And Paul is not celebrating suffering for its own sake. He's not saying that to be a Christian means we need to be miserable. But there are two reasons that Paul wants to address human suffering in the context of Christianity. First, for Paul, he knew, being persecuted himself, that sharing the gospel guarantees us being at cross purposes with the world. Because the world itself is sinful in nature. So affliction and distress and suffering are expected for those who are claimed by Christ. But Paul also sees that fragile, finite human beings experience distress and loss simply as a normal part of our lives. Paul wants to be sure we understand that human suffering or misfortune or affliction are never confused with sin, but rather are quite the opposite. Identifying with God with the gospel means we probably will encounter distress and suffering. But it is in that very distress that we can call on God and we can thank God for God's consolation and comfort and encouragement. Distress in our lives and all the things that cause us suffering, death, divorce, illness, all provide occasions where God can break through our human cover. They provide occasions for God's abundant comfort to come into our lives. And according to Paul, they provide occasions where we, too, can generously console those who we find in adversity. God's comfort is our model and our inspiration. Paul's use of the word we and us in his letter invites the Corinthian hearers and us to picture ourselves in solidarity with Paul before our compassionate God whose comfort meets our every distress. Paul further encourages his listeners to identify with him by his reference to Christ's suffering flowing over into our lives. At the center of all this are the suffering and consolations of Christ, which overflow within and through us. 
Christ's suffering for all not only became a means of abundant consolation and grace amid our own suffering, but they unite us with Christ so that we can share in the suffering of others. In Christ, we now have a different way of interpreting all that happens to us. All of our affliction now becomes a means for us to be able to console others who are suffering. Because the consolation we receive from God is not only from us, but it's for us to share with others as they go through the same. At the heart of Paul's opening engagement of the Corinthians is his foundational conviction that God comes to the aid of those who are afflicted, of those who are down and out. God dependably meets human suffering with overflowing comfort. God faithfully meets the affliction of believers with comfort, with consolation, and with encouragement. God is not sometimes merciful or occasionally comforting. God is continually and faithfully consoling us. Paul's message is just important, as important today as it was for the church in Corinth. God's comfort and compassion are not given to us to be our personal possession. But as recipients of God's merciful encouragement, we are to become the channels through whom God's comfort is made available to others who are themselves suffering. Before we pray, I'm going to do something a little bit different. At our 11 o'clock service, we, we pray a different way each week. We do um, just different kinds of prayer because it's a little bit different service. And I had written up this um, this prayer activity for that service, but um, my sermon's a little short, so I think we have time to do this. And what I did was I went through scriptures. The exercise is praying for encouragement, prayers of encouragement. And I went through places in scripture where we can draw on to formulate these prayers of encouragement, and I wanted to just share some examples, so that's what I'm going to do. As we pray, I'll give you the scripture reference and then the prayer that's based on that. So let us pray together. 1 Peter 5, 7. I will not worry about tomorrow. I will trust in my heavenly provider to meet the needs for today. For when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Thank you, God for protecting me and caring for all my needs. I am well taken care of. From Matthew 25, 23, Abba, Father, help me to recognize that you have called me to be faithful, not successful. Help me to focus my efforts in pleasing you alone, not people. Encourage me so that I will take on more responsibility than you intend for me, and I will be careful to humble myself as a faithful steward, whatever the outcome. Philippians 4.8 Spirit of the living God, correct my thinking. Help me to be strong and courageous in my thought life. Let fear and doubt be far from me. Instead, fuel my thoughts with faith. Proverbs 12, 26. Dear Lord, please send encouraging friends that promote your sovereignty in my life and remind me of your goodness. Thank you for the friends I have now that encourage me. Bless us with wisdom and favor always. Hebrews 4, 10. O oh, Heavenly Father, though I am dealing with disappointment and obstacles, I rest in the fact that you are still in charge. Lead me to enter into your rest, O oh Lord, and not be disillusioned by current circumstances. Romans 8, 28. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for working in all situations in my favor. 
Even if I can't see it right away, I know that you are in the midst of implementing your divine strategy on my behalf. Help me in times of trouble to magnify you and not the problem. Proverbs 6.6 6. Father, help me organize my day in a way that prepares me for unforeseen situations. Give me the grace to deal with problems in a loving way that honors you and others. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 God, help me to maintain a consistent prayer life and be replenished continually by your presence. I know that as I patiently wait on you in this season, you will surely renew my strength. I will run and not get tired. I will walk strongly. Psalm 103.2 Righteous, holy, and true one, I will not forget your benefits, as daily you help bear my burdens. Though I'm facing seemingly endless difficulties, I will not throw in the towel. I will set my eyes upon the hills and look forward with confidence of the future you have prepared for me. And finally, Job 13, 15. God, even if you slay me, I will still trust you and maintain my integrity before you. Strengthen my inner self to rely on you more and more each day. I lean not on my own understanding of the situation, but trust continually in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Wow, one of my all-time favorite hymns. Just can't beat that. I don't know what to say after that. So I'll say this. Remember, this was the message all through Job. God's with us in our suffering. But Paul brings that message a step further and says, God's comfort poured out on us is a gift to us, but it is also so that we can pour out that gift on others. So go out this week and take your charge seriously as a disciple of Christ to share God's love and compassion and comfort and encouragement with everybody that you meet and go knowing that you go with the blessing of God, our creator, Jesus Christ, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, now and forever. Amen.